proteases. As biochemists, we have a kind of a love-hate relationship with them. So basically, proteases are protein scissors. Um, or, so sometimes you might hear peptidase. Um, so this are sometimes used interchangeably, but basically a protein is a long chain of amino acids. So in a pro, and um, we call this chain a polypeptide, um, and then it folds up to form a functional protein. If you have, you can also have like shorter peptides. So a polypeptide would be a long chain of amino acids or protein letters. Um, but you can also have shorter chains um, and we typically call these like peptides. Um, and so a, sometimes these work as like hormones. Um, sometimes they're just like byproducts of protein breakdown, whatever. But anyway, so a protease or a peptide bait peptidase can actually cleave these peptide bonds ah, making your peptide or your protein split apart um and so when we're like purifying proteins we don't really want this to happen and so we add protease inhibitors which are going to prevent this from degrading our protein but other times we actually make use of proteases. So we can broadly classify peptidases as like kind of generic and more specific. So ones that like recognize really specific sequences and cut them. And so we make use of both of these types in the lab and I'll tell you more about that later. But first I wanna tell you about how our bodies make use of these and how viruses make use of these and how basically they work. So they have different mechanisms. So like basically modes of action, like how their scissors get their blades. Um, and so I'll talk more about this. Um, but first I wanna give a little bit of context. Oh, and another thing, so I sometimes say amino acid and sometimes say residue. So basically individual protein letters are called amino acids uh, because they have an amino group on one end um, and a carboxylic acid group on the other end. And when they combine together, they use those parts to join. So now they're no longer amino acids. And so we call what was the remainder a residue. And so you can see that you have this like generic backbone, but then you have these unique parts sticking out. And so each amino acid, it has this unique part and that's going to stick out. And so we talk about like residue sticking out into the active side and stuff. We're often talking about like the side chain of that specific amino acid. Um, and how it's oriented in like space in order to then like react and do things. These base different types of peptidases and proteases and by understanding how they work, we can then take advantage of how they work to inhibit them. And we typically, we do this a lot in the lab um, when we're doing protein purification. So you also hear, like we talked about the other day, about specific protease inhibitors. So the type of protease inhibitors we use in the lab are typically very nonspecific because basically we just want to inhibit like all the broad activity of these proteases because we're inhibiting these generic proteases. But there are also specific proteases that, say, a virus makes. And so we talked the other day about how um, the SARS-CoV-2, um, the coronavirus, it actually makes its protein. So normally we think of proteins as like individual chains that fold up. It makes this like polyprotein. So a long chain of this. So even longer than like a normal protein. And inside of it is like basically a bunch of proteins lined up. And it uses a protease to cut those proteins apart. And then those proteins can fold up into their functional products. Or they probably like fold partway in between. Um, so you have like partway intermediates. I tried to find more information, but it was really hard to find. But basically you have this long chain of proteins and then it's the protease's job to cut them apart so they can be used as individual proteins because it's kind of hard to use a protein when it's like stuck to something else. Um, it's like a three-legged race or something of proteins, and that's not gonna work. So the, the virus, it saves space Oopsie. and stuff by making it as a single um, polypeptide, polyprotein, and then it cuts it apart. But in order to cut it apart, it needs to make that protease. Um, and the idea with like Pfizer's new um, drug Paxlovid, it's a protease inhibitor. So it's going to inhibit that protein from cutting up that protease from cutting apart the individual proteins that the virus needs. And that's how it works. But we don't want to just add like a generic protease inhibitor because then it would inhibit just like 
this our own proteases. So we have proteases in our body. They play important roles in like digestion and that sort of thing. Um, but there's a time and a place for those too. And so those are confined to like our digestive system and our stomach and stuff. And they're actually, we, we take measures to prevent them from acting out. Um, so we have, they're often made as like inactive precursors called like zymogens and then those get cleaved by other proteases to activate them and then they can activate other proteases and you can have these chain reactions of activating proteases and that only is going to happen when the right proteases are in the right position in the right places and the right like acidity and all of that sort of thing so you can isolate their active action so for example trypsin is a digestive um protease so um it works in your digestive tract and but it's made as an inactive precursor so one of those zymogens and this one is called trypsinogen and it goes um so trypsin is made in this inactive form then it goes travels to the intestines and there it's going to get activated by another protease enteropeptidase and it's going to cut off the tail of the trypsin the or cut off the tail of the um trypsinogen turning it into active trypsin. And then trypsin can cut another zymogen, so another precursor, chemotrypsinogen, into chemotrypsin, and um, proelastase into elastase. And a similar strategy is also used by some hormones that are made as inactive prohormones um, and then are activated by cleavage. When it's action to get too out of hand, so you actually have natural inhibitors um, called serpins, um, so like antitrypsin. Um, and what it can do is it can kind of bind in the active site and make it change shape so that it gets stuck on. So you might have heard of one of these serpents in like a commercial for some emphysema treatments. Alpha-1 antitrypsin. So basically there is, um, in the bloodstream it protects your cells and your proteins um, from this protease called elastase. So elastase is made by some of these immune systems called neutrophils. They send out this elastase, which is this type of protease, and it's going to break down the connective tissue. So like the things around cells and stuff that are keeping like all that fibery stuff. Um, and this is going to allow, so they, they're made by these immune cells at sites of inflammation. And that's going to allow like, um, blood cells and immune cells to come in and have an easier time getting to the site of damage to repair it. But you don't want this elastase like working all over the place. You just want it specifically working in that site so it's not like chewing apart all of your connective tissue. And so cells can um, secrete like um, this serpent called alpha-1 antitrypsin and this is going to act as a sort of moat protecting um, the region, out protecting outside of the region from this um, protease, elastase. And so smoking can actually um, modify the serpent to make it less effective. And so this can allow the elastase to kind of chew up of more of the lungs. So that's why um, this alpha-1 alpha, this alpha one antitrypsin um, is, you might hear about it in like emphysema abs and stuff because some people have like also have a genetic alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Um, so they're at risk for emphysema even if they don't smoke, um, but people who smoke also, um, that's one of the reasons why they're more at risk for emphysema. emphysema. Um, and so your body has these natural inhibitors. So we have these ways to prevent the unwanted activity of proteases in our body so that we can use proteases controllably. So we don't want to introduce like an inhibitor that's going to inhibit our own proteases because we have, we're doing a good job keeping control over our proteases, right? And so what with these inhibitors, we actually take advantage of the preferences of the, um, of the various proteases. So like the viral protease, it's not a generic protease. It doesn't want to chew up our own proteins. It doesn't want to chew up its own proteins for that matter. It doesn't want to chew up this stuff because it needs, it needs our proteins to make its proteins and it needs its proteins to make more copies of itself and to expect other cells and all of this various stuff. So instead you want a very specific inhibitor. And so you take advantage of the um, preferences for the protease. So basically in the active site of the protease, so where those protein scissors are the active site it's not just like the catalytic residue so 
the um mpro so the protease the bile protease that is the target of this inhibitor it is a um, cysteine protease. So it uses a cysteine amino acid residue in its active site, and that's the catalytic um, residue. And that's the one that's gonna get stuck on the half of the protein um, while the other half gets moved out, and then the water's going to, um, well, the other half gets moved out. And so this part's gonna get stuck on. And it t the um, the Empro it has a kind of unique um, sequence specificity that it likes to cut next to a residue that isn't um, that our own peptide peptide uh, our own proteases don't really um, we don't have proteases that have that preference, and so by mimicking the peptide in a way and taking advantage of the like binding pocket, um, so these binding pockets are uniquely formed so that they have. That, and that's what gives it the preference because in addition to having that active site residue sticking out in order to attack, you actually need to have the peptide bind or the inhibitor bind in that pocket. And so the pocket has to be shaped um, in a way that can accommodate the, um, the substrate. So the thing that's the, that'll get cut or the inhibitor. And so by making, um, taking advantage of the shape of the pocket, you can make more specific inhibitors. But for like generic and um, proteases and stuff, they tend to have a more loosey goosey pocket. So it's um, it's harder to make like specific inhibitors for them. But that's why. But it also makes it good when we're doing protein purifications and stuff because we can just add a generic proteases inhibitors and they'll do the job. But we need to make sure we add inhibitors to inhibit all of the different types of proteases. Um, there's different types of proteases. They use different catalytic mechanisms, so they have different scissors basically. Um, so some of them, like serine proteases and cysteine proteases, they actually have this mechanism where they have a covalent intermediate. So when they're cutting the peptide when they cut this peptide sorry they're going to actually get stuck to half a peptide so they're going to do it in parts so at first they're going to get stuck and they're going to let half of this off and then this has to a water comes in and pushes this off so you get it happening in two steps so we can inhibit the these types of proteases with covalent inhibitors that kind of mimic the substrate so the thing the peptide that's going to get cut but when it gets stuck, it can't, the water can't push it off or it can't push it off as easily. Um, and so we can have covalent inhibitors um, that are basically going to get stuck on our scissors. And the reason why we can do this is be, you have that covalent intermediate because in the enzyme, so in this protease, in the active site, the scissors are actually getting their blades from amino acids, from a serine or a cysteine that is sticking out into that active site. <coughs> Oopsie. Um, and so that's why you're getting that direct intermediate. But with like aspartic proteases or metalloproteases, what they're actually doing is they're just activating water to do the job for them. So the protein, the letters are really important. The letters in the active site sticking out, the amino acids sticking out into the active site are super important because what they're gonna do is they're gonna make the right environment and help activate the water. Um, but the water is going to do the actual attack. The water is going to come in and it's going to attack this bond and split it through hydrolysis. So it's like direct from the water. Therefore, we can't, we don't have that covalent intermediate. We can't inhibit it like that. So instead, we typically use non-covalent inhibitors um, and that are competitive inhibitors. So basically, instead um, of getting, they still kind of, so they mimic the, the substrate. So they kind of mimic the peptide. But, the, and so you just, they'll compete for the active site of that peptide. So they'll compete with the, uh, or of that peptidase or that protease. So they'll compete with that site. But if you add, if you, you can like dilute it out basically, or you can compete it out. Um, and so it's just a competition between the things. Um, so basically you wanna flood it with this inhibitor because each inhibitor, it can get competed out by the actual, um, peptide. Proteases, some of them are really, really specific, um, such as like TEV protease or um, precision protease, um, which is like, I think it's like HRV3C or something protease. But anyway, these will only cut, they'll recognize a very, very specific sequence and they'll cut after that. And so when we're designing protein constructs to express, so basically we put the genetic recipe for making a protein into cells and get them to make it for us.
if we put that sequence in front of our protein sequence, so if we add to the gene of our protein, so if we add to the genetic instructions, the instructions for making like a tag. Um, and so we often do this to make it easier to purify or to increase the solubility. So we might do things like add a his tag. So like a chain of histidine, which is an amino acid res um, letter that'll allow it to stick to a nickel affinity column. Or we can add like a strep tag to make it bind to streptactin resin or MBP or GST or these various tags. Um, and these can be really helpful, but often once we use them to purify the protein, so we can use them as like a tag for affinity chromatography to help us like pull out the protein. But then we want to cut that tag off so, so we can just study the protein alone. So in those cases, it's really helpful to use a specific protease so we can introduce the specific sequence for that protease. And then after we do the affinity purification, so after we use that tag to pull our protein out and wash everything off and then compete off the protein, then what we can do is we can take our add the protease and cut it. And because we're using a specific protease that's only going to recognize that site, we don't have to worry about this generic chewing up. But there are more generic proteases, and we have to worry about these when we're doing a protein expression. So basically, in a protein um, expression, we're like expressing the protein in cells, and once it, when it's inside the cells, it's pretty safe. But as soon as you break open the cells, now the cells are exposed to all of the stuff that was like in the extracellular environment. And so even though we try to like wash off the media and stuff, there's going to be some proteases in there, and we don't want our protein to get degraded. So basically, because these other proteases are really like nonspecific, um, then they're just gonna chew up our protein and we don't want that to happen. So we add these protease inhibitors. And so we in, we add typically add like a cocktail of inhibitors. Um, so the cocktail might include things like PMSF, pepstatin, lupeptin, benzamidine, and aprotonin. Um, some might include EETA to steal metals. So basically the reason why we have to include all of these is because we need to, in, um, there's different types of proteases. They use biochemists, we like, the generic ones too. We often use them for things um, like limited proteolysis, where instead of adding a ton of a protease, we add just a little bit and see where it can cut. Um, because if we're adding a generic protease, it still needs to be able to like access the area. So areas that are more protected in the protein are going to be more resistant to cleavage, whereas areas that are like in linker regions and disordered regions, they're going to be easier to cleave. And so by adding like a smaller amount and even taking samples over time, you can do this like limited proteolysis and kind of see where cut sites are. This gives you an idea about where but like protein domain boundaries are and that sort of thing. So various, basically proteins can have like these folded areas called domains, um, so like structural domains, um, and then combined by kind of linker regions. And so the proteases will have an easier time cutting the linker regions than they will like the super fo solidly folded up parts. And so that is a really useful thing um, for figuring out like domains and stuff and structural biologists, we use it a lot. Um, we also use um, protease digestion for like mass spectrometry. So basically there we chop up a protein into a lot of peptides and then we um, look to see the identity of those peptides um, based on their mass. Um, and so this will allow us to th know things about both like modifications to those peptides as well as the identity of various proteins. Like if you have a band on a jelly, like what the heck is this? That's how I've used it mostly. Um, but you can also do it if you have um, like a whole cellular pro sample or something and you want to see how much of a protein is being, what proteins are being expressed and that sort of thing. So in those cases, you want to use the generic ones to chop things up. And then sometimes if you just want like the protein, uh, so you just want like the DNA or the RNA and you don't want proteins getting in the way of things, you can add like a protease to chew up all the proteins so you don't have to worry about them and you can get rid of them more easily. Another time I've used a um, generic protease is to clean a chromatography column. And so basically sometimes you can get protein like gunk and stuff build up on these columns. So these like tubes full of resin that we flow, like these little beads that we flow our protein through and separate the protein and stuff. Sometimes some of the protein gets like stuck on there. Um, and a way to clean it is you can actually like incubate it with um, like pepsin.
Um, so you flow it in and then you like stopper it. So you have the pepsin just like sitting in the column overnight and chewing up all that protein gunk. It was kind of scary. Um, I've done it a couple times and it was kind of scary both times because I'm like, ah, I'm putting a protease, general protease um, on this thing that I use to purify proteins. But yeah, so I was careful and I cleaned it really well afterwards and my column flowed a lot better afterwards. Um, so I've done it a couple times and yeah, it's a good trick.